Would you please join me in prayer? Father, one more time, we ask for your blessing and peace. We ask for a special anointing, Lord, on this message as we begin this series. I pray, Lord, that our hearts and minds will be attentive, that the Holy Spirit will especially help me, Lord, and help our ears and our hearts to be attentive and connect with what you're saying to the church in times like these. As we heard several weeks ago from Brother Joe, Lord, in times like these, Lord, these are very critical times we're living in. Help us to know what we should be thinking, how we should be living, and uh, how we should be worshiping you. Help me, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Help us all, Lord. I want to mention also that there are some um, note cards on the back. If you want to take notes, Brother Lanre, would you just wave at the folks? He has those in case you want to write some of this down. I've been asking God for a theme for the new year, as I often do. How many of you remember the theme from 2020? All right, probably because we didn't write it down, but... The theme in 2020, at least on my heart, and I don't make a big deal about this. Some people put up banners and they do all of this. They give out cards, and, and that's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with promoting things. But the theme last year was I can be and I can do. I can be and I can do everything that God desires for me. And that has to do with becoming the church that God sees. Catalyst has always had this slogan, we are the church who is becoming. We're not done yet. God is working us. We are who we are, but we're also a church in progress or a church in process. We are becoming uh, an ideal church. We are becoming the version of the church that God wants us to be. So in 2021, I just in, in light of that and in light of what God's been saying to me, I keep getting this theme, a passion for a healthy church. Everybody say that with me, a passion for a healthy church. And that's going to be my theme this year. That's going to be Pastor Angela's theme for this year. And hopefully our leaders will adapt the same idea that we want to do everything we can right now to be a church that is a a light on a hill. But how many of you know there's a dark world out there that needs a light on a hill? We need to be a lighthouse. We need to be a beacon. So I want to talk to you this morning about what it means to have a, a healthy church, a healthy church. And one of the first parts of that, and we'll be continuing this series for a little while, is a healthy church has a biblical worldview. Everybody say, a biblical worldview. What is a biblical worldview? Well, some of you may know already, but if you want a definition, a biblical worldview is the framework or the lens through which we view our world and the lives that we live. I'm going to say that again. A biblical worldview is a lens through which, or a worldview, whether it's biblical or not, a worldview is a framework or a lens through which we view the world we live in and how we live out our lives. It's our personal reality. A worldview is how you view life, how the world affects you and how you are reacting to the world around you. Whether it is consciously or subconsciously, every person, everyone sitting here, everyone who is watching by Facebook this morning, has some type of world view. You could call this like an operating system in computer language, for those of you who are into computers. A world view is like an operating system. It is the framework by which you view life, how you respond to life, uh, the major ways in which you think what's important to you, how you fit into the world around you, how you react to the world around you, that is your worldview. And you're going to see right away that there's a big difference between having a Christian worldview and a secular worldview. We're going to draw a contrast this morning between a Christian worldview or a biblical worldview and a secular worldview, which is what the majority of people in the world who do not know Jesus have adapted. And unfortunately, what you're going to find out today is that even people who are sitting in churches have adapted a worldview that is not really biblical. That it may be shocking to hear, but the truth of the matter is that the world is very good at promoting what they believe. 
I mean, every three minutes on television, every five minutes on television, it seems like you have five minutes worth of commercials, right? And there's billboards, and there's magazines, and there's advertising, and there's so many ways. There's social media. There's those flash ads that come up on social media that are so annoying. Somebody say amen. The world is bombarding us constantly with what we should think, how we should live, what we should buy, and if we want to be successful, if we want to look right, if we want to feel right, if we want to uh, be proud of ourselves, and if we want to have all of these things, then we've got to do what the world says. But the Bible says that we are in the world, but not of the world. Somebody say amen. Christians need to have a different world view. Jesus came to deliver us out of the kingdom of darkness and bring us into the kingdom, another realm entirely, a spiritual realm of his own dear son, Jesus Christ. That you'll find in Colossians 1.13. For he has called us out of this darkness into his marvelous light. For God has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us who believe into the kingdom of his dear son. So every believer, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ this morning, you have a different realm that you live in. You have a spiritual dimension that is not from this world. It does not find its uh, inception or its genesis from this world. It comes from heaven. Somebody say amen. It comes from heaven. And so we march to a beat of a different drum. We have a different set of values. Everything from A to Z is influenced by the Word of God and by the Holy Spirit. It is not just automatically that we go along with everything that the world says and everything that the world does. When Jesus was being tried by Pilate, Pilate says, why don't you defend yourself? Why don't you say something? Because Jesus was quiet. He knew what his mission was. He knew he came to give his life, to die for the world, for our sins. And Jesus said to him, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, I, would send, I could send right now thousands of angels, and they would fight for me and destroy the whole world. But I have come on a mission to save the hearts of men. I'm not here to establish a government right now. Eventually, he will establish a government. Amen? But his first mission in coming to the world was to change what needed to be changed the most, not the government, but the heart of mankind. Because you can change governments and you can change laws, but changing laws doesn't necessarily make somebody a better person. Because there's something inside of every man and woman and boy and girl called sin. And it's sin that brings evil into the world. It's sin that brings hatred. It's sin that brings pornography. It's sin that brings adultery. It's sin that brings racism. Come on, somebody. Are you with me this morning? Jesus came to deal with the sin factor. He wanted to establish his kingdom inside of us first. And then someday he is coming back. We sang about it this morning, right, Brother Angel? He is coming back with myriads of angels and with all the saints who have gone before us. And the Bible says that the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our God and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever and ever and ever. Give the Lord a hand of praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. God's going to transform everything that you see will be changed. He will rule the nations with a rod of iron. It's time, church, that we decide once and for all that we are not part of this world. Now, now, hear me out. It doesn't mean that you're going to go hide in a cave somewhere and isolate yourself from people and hide or not, you know, go to work and just stay in your room. That's not what I'm saying. We're going to rub shoulders with the world, but we're going to know that we are children of the light. We are not children of darkness. Hallelujah. We are not those who uh, keep on continually sinning because we have been born from above. We have a new ho Holy Spirit that lives inside of us that has changed us and broken the power of sin over our lives. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad that through Christ's death and resurrection, sin's power has been broken over your life? For if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. 
a whole new creation, a brand new person. If you're a follower of Christ, you have a brand new soul. You have a, a soul that is infused by the Holy Spirit. You have a new destiny. You have a new operating system. So we are in this world, but not of the world. So therefore, our worldview is and must be forever changed. If we are children of the kingdom of God, amen, then we have a new set of orders. We have a new realm that we live in. We have a new king, a new boss in our life. We are no longer the boss. If you belong to Jesus, guess what? He should be in the driver's seat in your life. Jesus doesn't just come along for the ride. Somebody say amen. When he moves in, he takes over. Say, I am under new management. Jesus is the Lord of my life. A born-again Christian recognizes that their life is no longer their own. We have been purchased by God from, back from sin and hell and the grave. We were forever separated from God because of our sins. We were dead Dead in our trespasses and sin, the Bible says. But God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. He took our dead spiritual man and resurrected it. When we're baptized in water, most of you have been baptized in water, you go down into that water which represents the grave in which Christ paid for our sins. And then when you come back up out of the water, it symbolized the resurrection of Christ in which Christ justified us and forgave us our sins. And then we are, the Bible says, spiritually raised with Christ and seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. So we are living, even though we're here in the physical world and we don't act weird because, you know, we, we're part of heaven's citizenship. We don't act strange and all spooky. We act like normal people. But we realize that God is the boss. We realize I just can't go along with the You guys are all going out to get high. I can't do that. Oh, over here, you want to tell a dirty story? I, I can't do that. I'm not part of the world. I have a different morality. I have a different principle that I live with. I live by the truth of God's word. I live by honest principles. I live by selfless principles. I want to love people. I don't want to hate people. Somebody say amen. I have a whole different operating system in my life that has been put in there by the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's what it means when it says we are born of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who transfers us and changes us inside and makes us children of the living God. We also have a new owner's manual. It's called the Holy Bible. Somebody say amen. amen. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. This book will save your life. This book is full of God's truth. This book will be manna for your soul. This book will help you when you're dying. I was just reading a, a book about one of our missionaries that we support, Tom and Phyllis Benegas, who are in Brussels, Europe. They're involved with the Continental Bible College there in Europe, and we support them on a monthly basis. Well, Phyllis, the wife of this missionary, Tom, they're both missionaries, really, she caught COVID right at the beginning in March when it first broke out in Europe, and she got it really bad. She was immediately put on a ventilator, oxygen, 21 days, separated. Her husband couldn't even visit her, just went to the hospital with the, her, her pocketbook and the clothes on her back, and they said, you're not leaving, and you, you go home, told her husband Tom to go home, and she was there for 21 days, and she wrote a little book about it. She sent a copy to us. I'll show it to you if you want to see it. It's called The Breath of Life, a very appropriate title, amen, on a ventilator, and she said she went in and out of consciousness, in and out of consciousness, and the thing that just absolutely was amazing to her that while she was going in and out of consciousness, the Holy Spirit was still working in her spirit, reminding her of Scripture verses that she had learned when she was a child in children's church. She said, I don't, I just can't tell you, this was like automatic. God was just working. I had no strength. I had no ability to talk. I had tubes in me. But what I remember is the Word of God. Hallelujah. And she just kept rehearsing these Scriptures in her mind. And she said... 
that she even did some re research, and there is a medical doctor who find out, found out through various testing that, that Christian people who have the scriptures in their minds are healthier. That actually creates a healthy environment in your mind. The Word of God is life. Somebody say amen. amen. And, of course, God brought her through, and she's back to health. To God be the glory. Amen. amen. But there is a danger there's a danger of, in all of us, around all of us, whether it's in the educational system or it's in the media or it's just our own flesh that just wants its own way. The Bible says we fight against the flesh, right? The devil and this world. The world, the flesh, and the devil are the three enemies of Christ. And what happens is, whether it's consciously or subconsciously, this worldly uh, view of the way life is, the worldview of humanism, the worldview of selfishness, the worldview that says, me first, the worldview that says, put pleasure before God, the worldview that says, put yourself, just live for yourself, don't care about anybody else. The, there's so many parts of it. We're going to get into some of it. But this is the danger we face. And it's not going to just happen. You're not going to have a spiritual or biblical worldview just by accident. Somebody say amen. You have to intentionally think about what you're thinking. And let me just give you some scriptures to tell you what I'm talking about. Colossians 2.8, just to clarify this. Colossians 2.8, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophies which depend on human tradition or humanism and the elemental spiritual forces of this world. In other words, the darkness that's in this world can take you captive in your mind. See to it that no one, that you don't let that happen. Are you with me this morning? I'm try, trying so hard to go quickly and, and, and bring this to your hearts. But I need you to listen real well this morning. You have to be on God. People around you, people at the office, people at school, your neighbors, many of them have bought into a secular, humanistic view of the world. That, you know, when you die, you die. That's it. There's nothing more to this life. When you're dead, you know, you're six foot under, and that's the end of it. They don't have a spiritual view. They don't understand eternal life. They don't understand that we have the power to live above this world. We don't have to give in to sin. We don't have to go along the crowd that is rebellious. We don't have to be racist. Hallelujah. We don't have to be homosexual. Come on now, somebody say amen. We understand that there is a right way and a wrong way. We understand that the Bible spells it out very clearly. And if you need help, the Lord also gives you the Holy Spirit to help you understand the Bible. How many of you know you can't go wrong? You have the Word and the Spirit. Come on. Let me read another one for you, Romans 12, 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do not conform. To me, this shows me that this has to be intentional, that if you don't watch out, this is going to happen. Because it's so easy to atrophy. Atrophy means if you do nothing, you, sl you go downhill. Yeah. Those of you who are into exercise, atrophy means that if you just sit on the couch all the time, you're going to turn into a couch potato. Yeah. And you're even going to look like a potato. Come on now. <laughs> Somebody say amen. You got to make, make up your mind. You got to make up your mind. I'm going to get up off this couch. I'm going to go out and take a power walk outside. I'm going to take a brisk walk like we try to do three times a week. Amen. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. Be transformed by the renewing. Then you will able to test and know the will of God, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now, there are a couple of other translations of Romans 12, too, that I want to bring to your attention. This one, you'll, you'll not see this on the screen. But this is Romans 12, 2 in another translation. I love this one. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Everyone's doing it. Have you ever heard that? Have you ever heard a teenager or somebody say, well, everyone's doing it. 
Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Whether it was 2,000 years ago when Christians had to be persecuted for their faith and were scattered because the religious elite were threatened and jealous of this new movement and Christians stood up and said that Jesus is Lord. Caesar is not Lord. Jesus is Lord. And because of that, those Christians lost their lives. Many of them were put into the arena to fight the wild beasts and the gladiators, cut them to pieces. Some of them were literally tied to a tree or a, a cross and lit on fire. They would pour oil. Read about it in history. What the Roman Empire did to Christians. What makes us think that we can just blend in with the world? Come on now. Am I just preaching to myself this morning? Don't fit in with the world. We are still the light of the world. It's okay to say no to sin. It's okay to say, wait a minute, if it's not in here, I'm not going along with it. Come on. I I found this other one. Stop imitating. This is Romans 12, too paraphrased. Stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you, but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit, a total reformation of how you think. This is especially pertinent to young people. Young people are absolutely susceptible to influencers in our world, especially in the media, social social culture, uh, the social media. Facebook, Twitter, all of these different avenues are tremendously influencing our culture today. Tremendous influence. And we have to fight back. Not not fight them, but we have to stand up for what's right. And it's not going to happen automatically. It's what's automatic is going downhill. I mean, like any, like they say, any dead fish can float downstream. You don't even need to be alive to go downstream. You could just float. But it takes a live fish to fight against the stream, to fight against the current. Hallelujah. To say no to the world and say yes to Jesus. Hallelujah. Why are we having this series? Why are we having a series on a biblical worldview as part of a healthy church? Because recently... A survey was done by George Barna, many of you have heard of him, asking questions of people in church. Are you ready for this? Asking these questions on a survey, people in church, do you believe in absolute moral truth? Do you believe the Bible contains and defines absolute truth? Is the Bible accurate in all of its teachings? Did Jesus Christ live a sinless life? Is God the all-powerful and all-knowing creator of the universe? Is Satan real? Is there a final judgment? Is there such a thing as heaven and hell? Would you believe, and there were other questions too, but I don't want to take too much time. Would you believe that only 21% of people in church answered yes to all these questions? There is a, a pandemic an epidemic of biblical illiteracy right now. There is a virus that is spreading in the world. It is called secular humanism. It's just to believe the way the world believes. Just go along. You might as well give in because everything's changing. You know, culture is changing. The world is changing, so we have to go forward. We have to let go of the old and go on with the new. But that does not apply to morality. Somebody say amen. That does not apply. Yes, I don't wear the type of clothes I wore 50 years ago. Well, maybe I do. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I, I definitely wore more cool clothes, all right? Let's just put it that way. I was more cool 50 years ago. But I want to tell you something. The things we believe in as Christians. The Bible puts it this way. 
in the book of Jude, Paul says, earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. Brother Joe, contend for the faith that you heard in the beginning. In the book of Revelation, God said to the church in Ephesus, you have left your first love. What happened to your love? Because the world doesn't care about each other, does that mean we're supposed to go along with the world? Because the world has no forgiveness? Because there are fathers who have left their, their families and abandoned their families? Does that mean we have to live that way and, and, and hate that man and not forgive and, and end up being scarred for life? No, because if you're in Christ, you can have a brand new life. Hallelujah. God can bring healing to your soul. Whatever the scars are in your life, Christ can bring healing in your life, can give you the things that you believe for, the peace and the ideals that you hope for. We're having this series because the worldview that dominates our culture today and our media is spreading like a virus, and it is cat capturing the hearts and minds of millions of children and adults in our church. Some of these views I'm going to just uh, mention right now. Pastor Angela started helping me before with preaching some of these. Thank you, Pastor Angela. <laughs> me first. That's one of very common cultural norm. It's a norm today. Me, myself, and I. I am my own God. I'll tip my hat to God. Maybe I'll even show up in church, maybe Christmas and Easter. Come on now. But I call the shots. Nobody's going to run my life. I'm my own boss. This is called humanism. Man is his own God. I'm going to create what I believe. I'm going to develop my own truth. Uh, I'm going to decide what I want to do and don't want to do. There's going to be nothing outside of me, nothing outside of this little circle here. Even in Jesus' time, the rulers were so full of themselves, the religious rulers, they were jealous of him. And see, so you could even be a religious person and still miss this. And they said, to, they said about Jesus, we will not have this man rule over us. We're in charge. Romans 1.25 says, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped, watch this, the things they created rather than the creator, the things they created. So God said, do not make a, a graven image in the form of a beast or any other animal because God created all these things and God is far above the heavens and created the whole world and the whole universe. But what did they do the first chance they had? They made a golden calf. So they worship something they created rather than the creator. See, this is humanism. I'm going to create my own gods. I'm going to create my own theology. I'm going to create whatever I think is sin. Instead of God telling me what's sin, I'm going to decide for myself what is sin. That's humanism. But the biblical view, the worldview we should adapt is what was said in Exodus 20, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me, including yourself. Come on. What was the first temptation of Satan to Adam and Eve? He said to them, you will be like God. He told them. He said, what did God say? Did God really say you shouldn't eat of this forbidden fruit? No, no, go ahead and participate because God is trying to cheat you. He knows that you're going to become like God. And so they partook, and, you know, the rest is history. The biblical view, instead of humanism, should be if you try to keep your life for yourself, you will lose it. If you live with a me-first mentality, you will miss the greatest things in life. But if you give up your life for me, Jesus said, you will find true life. If you're just living with a me-centric me world, uh, insecure, and you may not be a bad person. It's not because, you know, you're a terrible person that you live a very self-centered life. 
It could be because you've been hurt a lot. It could be because you're afraid. It could be because you're insecure. But whatever the case, you can trust Jesus with your life. Hallelujah. He has a plan. Somebody say, He has a plan. He has a future for me. He has a calling for me. I want to go up there where He is. Hallelujah. I, I don't mean to heaven, but I mean in this world, I want to listen to His drum beat. Hallelujah. Like Paul said, I have not been disobedient to the heavenly calling. Next is materialism. First, humanism. Secondly, materialism. Can be summed up in one word. I need more stuff. I need more stuff. Is there anybody around you or anybody in your life that you is like that? Nobody here, of course, right? We're we're all we're all perfect here. But materialism becomes a prevailing part of our culture. It becomes a person's worldview. Because what they're saying in materialism is that I can fill the empty places in my life with more things to make me feel like a whole person. Wow, think about that for a second. I want to repeat that in case you didn't write that down. Materialism says, I can fill the empty places in my heart with more things and I will feel whole. I will feel satisfied. And how many of you know that's not true? Because sometimes the people with the most toys do not win. They are the ones who commit suicide. Come on now. What is the biblical view? Instead of materialism, here's what Jesus, he taught a story about a rich man who had barns that were full of stuff. And he said to himself, I don't know what to do. I've got my stuff put away. and I got so much material goods. I'm going to build more barns and I'm going to fill up more barns. And Jesus, in this parable, said, but God, speaking for God, he said, God said to this man, thou fool, this night your life will be required of you. This night you're going to die, and what are you going to take with you? Everything that you have set aside will be left behind. Everything. And so Jesus said, a man's life, in this same story, Luke tw uh, chapter 12, a man's life does not consist of, in the abundance of his possessions. Number three, do what feels good. That's another part of the world view that many people who do not know Christ have adapted. Do whatever feels good. If it feels good, do it. How could it be wrong if it feels so good? You ever hear that? How could it be wrong if it feels so good? Well, what if it feels good if I punch you in the face? <laughs> Will that make it right? Come on now. There's a belief in this world that the most important thing in life is how we feel. But here's what the Bible says. Proverbs 21, 17. We don't have this one on the screen. Uh, this is the message translation. Are you addicted to thrills? What an empty life you have. The, for the pursuit of pleasure is never satisfied. That's Proverbs 21, 17 in the message translation. Are you addicted to thrills? Live for pleasure. Live for what feels good. What an empty life you have, God says. For the pursuit of pleasure is never satisfied. Wow. Number four. Truth is not absolute. You, truth evolves. This is another philosophy or belief that people in the world who don't know Jesus, who are not following the Bible, they have adapted. Whether they do this consciously or subconsciously, it's an operating system that they have adapted. Are you with me today? Truth is not absolute. Truth evolves. This worldview blurs the lines of right and wrong and seeks to rationalize and promote with fine-sounding rhetoric things that are contrary to what the Bible clearly says is sinful and wrong. I'm going to say that again because that's a mouthful. Truth evolves is a worldview that blurs the lines of right and wrong and seeks to rationalize and promote with fine-sounding rhetoric. 
Let me stop there for a second. You know what? I've heard many uh, preachers say this, and it's a true, really powerful statement. Brother Andrew, I'm sure you'll agree with this. The world is promoting unhealthy things, but they do it in such a good way. They can promote unhealthy things, and they make it look like, wow, this is the best thing. The, 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 the advertisements and the, the media, it's just how much money they put into promoting things that are really not the best. And then it says, it says here, promoting things with fine-sounding rhetoric. There are people who can give a speech and make you think that, hey, this is good. This is good. You know, let's all go out and get drunk. You know, this is good. Let's all, you know, become homosexuals. This is great. Let's all go out and tear down our government. Let's all go out and burn down buildings or invade the Capitol. Come on now. Somebody. It's easy with fine-sounding rhetoric to make things that are sinful sound right. That's why we need to be on our knees. That's why we need to pay attention to the Bible. It has to be intentional. Truth does not evolve. Truth is still God's truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the truth. And then the last one is that, and I don't have time to go into all of it right now, but the last one is, you'll hear more about this. God doesn't exist. There's no God. How can you prove there's a God? This worldview is called atheism or naturalism. Have you ever met people who thought they were atheists? I, I saw a beautiful movie about Richard uh, Wormbrand who wrote the book uh, Tortured for Christ. How many of you have heard of the book Tortured for Christ by Richard Wormbrand? He's a, a Romanian person who, uh, under the communist regime in Romania, was thrown in jail because of his beliefs in Christ. He was a Christian. And the communists didn't like that, and they wanted him to swear allegiance to the communist ideology. He said, no, I stand for Jesus. I'm a Christian. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. He was in jail for 14 years and was tortured many times. I can't even tell you the kind of torture they did to him. You should read the book. But he said something that blew my mind. When it came time for them to die, they put them in this certain room. It's called room number four in the prison. That's where they sent the worst ones who were sick. Some of them had, he had tuberculosis. He wasn't fed well. The conditions were horrible, unsanitary conditions. Everybody in room four died except him. He was finally released after 14 years. And this is what blew my mind. He said half or more of those guys who came in there, because there were political prisoners in there as well, not just Christians. He said they were also sent to room four. He says, I would tell them about Jesus. And he said the amazing truth was not one of those persons who died, died an, an atheist. Every one of them accepted Christ as they got closer to, to that moment. There were no atheists left in room four. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is real. Look around you, the Bible says. Who made all these things? Look at the stars. The Bible says he calls them out. Not one of them is missing. He names them all one by one. He knows every single star. He spoke the worlds into existence. Who made these things? You think the beauty of a flower just is an accident? The symmetry, the color, the diversity in the ocean, the millions and millions of species, and how life thrives only on this planet. This is the only blue planet in the whole universe. To this day, no scientist, no telescope, whether it's a Hubble telescope or any other, 
has been able to see the blue planet, two-thirds water, thriving with life. Who did all this? Don't tell me this was an accident. Here's what the Bible says about those who deny God. First of all, Psalm 53 said they're fools. The fool has said in his heart there is no God. Romans 1.25, from the beginning of creation, I think we have this one, Jimmy. From the beginning of creation, God has shown what he is like by all he has made. That's why people who don't, that's why those people don't have any excuse. Those who say there's no God and God hasn't revealed himself. Because they know about God, but they don't honor him or even thank him. They claim to be wise, but they are fools. And in that same chapter, in Romans chapter 1, it says, because that which may be known about God, his nature and his divine Godhead, is revealed in the things that he created. You could see evidence or fingerprints of God in creation. I, I mean, just to give you a little example, and this is a whole subject all by itself, a, a beehive. Study bees, okay? This is, <laughs> it'll blow your mind. First of all, the b bumblebee's wings are too small to create lift, and he, he shouldn't be able to fly because his wings are so small that even though he flaps them, it, it doesn't create enough lift for him to fly, but yet he still flies. When you have a hive of bees, somehow all the worker bees flap their wings at the same way in the same time so that the temperature of the beehive is exactly, I forgot what it's supposed to be like, 86.5 degrees constantly. So the, the bees create an automatic heating or cooling system in their own hive. This is all science. I'm not making stuff up here. And those are just minor things. The, the possibility of life existing on earth is so minuscule. I did a research one. I, I was a, uh, what would you call that? I like to dabble in science. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a wannabe scientist. Come on. I'm a wannabe scientist. But the probability of having the right mixture of oxygen and nitrogen and hydrogen and all of this and the distance from the sun and the, the, the gravity has to be, just, the tilt of the earth has to be just right. The chemical structure of everything is like one in 10 trillion, 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 trillion possibility. You know, what they tell you the odds about the lotto, one in a billion. Don't go there. Get me, don't get me started. <laughs> but the odds of being life being on earth are so minuscule. It's like you can't even count the zeros. That's how impossible it is. Yet life exists and it thrives. And there was a man who was sent to this world 2,000 years ago from heaven, and his name was Jesus. He was the Son of God who came to show us the way back to the Father. And if you don't know him today, you are missing the greatest thing in life. I'm going to ask you to pray with me right now. Would you please bow your head? And Father, I pray that you would help everybody in this room. Lord, that by your spirit, you would knock on their heart's door. And you would help them to understand that you are the one that they have been seeking. You are the one they've been longing for. That you, Jesus, are the one they need to have in their life. You paid the highest price that we could be in the family of God. You literally gave your life's blood to pay for our sins and to restore our relationship with Father God, our Creator. And you want us to live a life that is abundant, a life that you have called us to, a life that has meaning and purpose for the highest purposes and the highest things that you can imagine. You want us to have that kind of life. But we've got to submit to you first. We've got to say, I need you in my life. Lord, forgive me of my sins. Forgive me for living selfishly and pushing you out or keeping you out of my life. So I'm going to ask you to say the simple prayer, whether you're watching at home or you're here in this audience. Just say the simple prayer in your heart. Lord Jesus, be merciful to me. I admit that I'm a sinner, Lord. I've lived my own life. You have not been in the center. You have not been on the throne of my life. 
I ask you now, Lord Jesus, to come into my heart. I believe you are the Son of God who came into this world to restore me back to the Father. I ask you to wash my sins away. I'm sorry for my sins. I repent of them, Lord. I don't want to live selfishly. I ask you to be the Lord of my life. Live in my heart and help me to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. If you, if you said that prayer this morning, just lift your hand to God. Say, yes, I've, I prayed with you for my heart, Lord. I would encourage you to take out a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, we could give you one. We could send you one at home if you don't have one. But start reading the Gospel of John or the Gospel of Mark and study the life of Jesus, and you'll be amazed at how much you'll resonate with his life because you'll see that he truly is the way, the truth, and the life. Let the church say amen. Let's stand together. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Amen. This is your house. Father, come and dwell. This is your house. A holy house of prayer. A holy house of prayer. Where the lost and the lonely. Where the lost and the lonely. Bring their burdens. Bring their burdens and their cares. This is your house. This is your house. Lord, come and dwell. Lord, come and dwell. Sing it again. This is your house. Father, come and dwell. This is your house. A holy house. Where the lost and the lonely, where the lost and the lonely bring their burdens, bring their burdens and their cares. This is your house. This is your house. Lord, come and dwell. Come and dwell. Hallelujah. I'm almost speechless after this message. And I pray that if you hadn't accepted Jesus as your personal Savior and as Lord of your life, that you prayed with Pastor Dave. But another thing occurred to me is how many of us sitting here, uh, how many of us watching, have adapted a, a secular worldview rather than a biblical worldview? How many of us has humanism, I'm going to do it my way, my time, I'm going to create God in my image? How many of us have sought materialism till we're exhausted and empty? How many of us have, uh, give me some of the other ones, done some of the other things, uh, you know, said there is no God? Or maybe we've said it and we haven't lived it. So I just want to pray with truth. Yes, we, we think that truth is relative or Whatever I want to believe about truth, I can pick and choose. I'm just asking the Lord in my life today, and I ask you to join me. If some of these worldviews have started to cloud my mind and my spirit and taken my pure and simple devotion to Jesus Christ away, would you just take a moment to reflect on that? It's not like we want to just bring conviction to you, but you know the... The discipline of the Lord is a good thing in our lives. If we don't feel anything anymore, we really need to get a physical, <laughs> a spiritual physical checkup. So God, I just want to ask with my brothers and sisters, those in the auditorium and those watching, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts if we've adapted a secular worldview in any one of these areas or ones that pastor hasn't even mentioned yet. Lord, we stand on your word. We believe your word. We believe there is truth. We believe that you are the one true God and that you're worth giving our lives to and for if necessary. Lord, we thank you that we don't seek things. We seek the creator, not the created things, not the things we make in our image, but we seek our creator and our life will be fulfilled 
in Jesus Christ. We thank you for it. Continue to speak to us through this week and bless us as we leave. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. I'd like us to just sing before we go. Um, the song, if it says it so well, I hope this is what's happening in your life. You want to invite Jesus to be preeminent, to be the boss, to be the sit in the, the, the main chair, the head chair. Come in, come in to stay. Come into my house, Lord Jesus. I just want to pray a blessing. Angela and I want to pray a blessing. Put out your hand, Pastor Angela. Lord, may the grace, just receive this blessing right now. May the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, Abide with you now and forevermore. And all God's people said, amen and amen. God richly bless you. We'll see you. Don't forget on Wednesday, we're praying on the phone. We're also here Tuesday at 1130 to 1230 for prayers. Wednesday, 1130, 1230. And Wednesday night by phone. God bless you.